Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 36 to 40. So first I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 36, it says a student plans on performing a liquid-liquid extraction to isolate an analyte from aqueous solution into acetone. Which of the following will most likely result from this experimental setup? So someone wants to have a liquid-liquid extraction, and they want to isolate something, so that's the purpose of the extraction, but they're using an aqueous solution and acetone. So what's going to happen? So the point of a liquid-liquid extraction is that you have two different liquids, and usually they should be immiscible, meaning they don't mix with each other, so that they have different properties, and then what dissolves in one is separated from what dissolves in the other. Usually we use an aqueous solution, and then also an organic solvent as well, and then these two shouldn't mix. But the problem here is that we use an aqueous solution, meaning we've used water, and then we've also used acetone. And water is a very polar molecule, and like dissolves like, Acetone is also a very polar molecule, and you might think that acetone is overall an organic solvent, and yeah, technically it is, but it isn't true that organic solvents do not always dissolve in aqueous solvents. It's most most it's more so that their property should be different enough that we have an organic solvent which does not mix with an aqueous solvent. Acetone is very polar and it does mix, and so that's going to be a problem because our two solvents are mixing. We're not getting the two separate layers that we should. We can't do this extraction properly and isolate the analyte. If you had a different organic solvent, like for example diethyl ether, or you had uh, dichloromethane, those are organic solvents that are more hydrophobic because of the carbons and hydrogens present, and not as strongly polar, even though they have some polarity, and therefore they don't mix as well with water. But acetone is polar enough that it will mix. So option A is saying the extraction will work because organic solvents are not miscible with water. That's incorrect. They can be miscible depending on their properties. Option B is saying the extraction will work because solvent choice is not relevant to this extraction. That's incorrect. Solvent choice is very key. Actually, you want to look at your analyte that you're focused on and the other byproducts in the system or in the reaction and make sure you choose the right solvent. So this is key to extractions. Option C is saying the extraction will not work because the analyte is not soluble in acetone. We don't really know anything about the analyte, so we can't state that. And then option D, therefore, is correct. The extraction will not work because the solvents are miscible. That's the key thing here. You're messing up something which is a key part of liquid-liquid extractions, and therefore the extraction is not going to work properly. In question 37, we're asked which of the following is least likely to impact the boiling point of a solvent. So which one's least likely going to impact boiling point? So boiling point is based on intermolecular attractions, so meaning between different molecules in a solution. And these include things like van der Waals forces, dipole attractions, and ionic attractions, as well as hydrogen bonding. So option A is saying the number of hydrogen bonds it can form. No, that's definitely something that will affect boiling point. Option B is saying the molecular weight of the molecule. This will also affect boiling point because molecular weight usually goes hand in hand with van der Waals forces. So the bigger a molecule is, the more van der Waals forces there are between different molecules in a solution and therefore it has a higher boiling point. Option C is saying the presence of d orbitals in any of its atoms and that's correct. So specifically like d orbitals or orbitals in general don't really have a part to play unless we're talking more specifically about the valence electrons and the possible intermolecular attractions that they could have, but d orbitals usually don't house valence electrons, and so it's not likely that these orbitals specifically are going to affect boiling point. And finally, option D is saying the presence of charged species on an atom. It definitely would, because charged species means we have an ionic solution, and that definitely does affect intermolecular attraction, and therefore the boiling point. So C is the correct answer here. Moving on to question 38, it says an otherwise lipid-soluble steroid molecule can be made water-soluble by which of the following modifications? So we want to take a lipid-soluble steroid, modify it, so now that it's water-soluble. And usually when we're talking about a lipid-soluble lipid steroid, we're talking about something which is significantly hydrophobic. So even if you have something that is overall mainly hydrophobic and it has some polar functional groups on it, like 
a few OHs, we still consider it mainly hydrophobic and therefore it's going to be overall lipid soluble and not water soluble. So to make it water soluble, we need to have an actual drastic change, not just something slightly, slightly that makes it a bit more polar. So option A is saying reducing alcohol groups. That's incorrect because this is implying that we're taking an alcohol, alcohol group down to just like a hydrocarbon, which means that if we're removing an OH and just putting an H there, we're actually making the molecule less polar and we're making it more so lipid soluble. So this is incorrect. We want to make it more polar. Option B is saying adding, adding carboxylic acid groups. This would be very good because carboxylic acid groups, first of all, they're very polar because they have two oxygens attached. And additionally, the oxygen can undergo hydrogen bonding. And if we have a high enough pH, that carboxylic acid can also be deprotonated. And then we have the presence of a negative charge. And an ionic charge which is actually very good for leading to increased polarity and then having this molecule dissolve in a polar solvent. So this would be a really good choice. Let's see if there's a better choice though. Option C is saying oxidizing hydrogen atoms to alcohol groups. And then this is similar to option B. We're adding more oxygen, so it's pretty good. Except what we're doing here is we're taking hydrogen to alcohol groups. So we're adding that OH group, which is good because we can have some hydrogen bonding going on with the OH groups and then also add some polarity because of that carbon oxygen bond. However, this is not as significant as adding a carboxylic acid group. So between the two, B would be a much better answer. For C, you can take like a steroid molecule and add like, depending on the size of the steroid molecule, one or two OH groups. And overall, we can still say that it is a mainly hydrophobic molecule. But a carboxylic acid is a much more significant change because you're adding at least two oxygens. And then you can also have that presence of that negative charge, whereas that's not likely to happen with an alcohol group. So B would be a much better answer. And option D is saying decarboxylation, that's the opposite of B. That would be getting rid of a carboxylic acid group. That would ma be making the molecule more lipid soluble and less polar. So we can remove option D. In question 39, we're asked into which solvent would the following compound most easily dissolve? So this co compound is overall going to be hydrophobic because of all these carbons and hydrogens. And then additionally, like this nitrogen over here, it has three methyl groups attached, so it can not it can participate like a little bit in hydrogen bonding, but it's not a hydrogen bond donor. So this molecule does have some polarity to it, but it's an overall hydrophobic molecule. So that best matches up with option C, dichloromethane. This compound, because of the carbons and hydrogens, is an overall organic compound, so we want to dissolve it in an organic solvent like chloroform, and we do want because of the nitrogens, there to be like a, a slight polarity to this molecule as well. Because hexane would not be good, it's an organic solvent, but it wouldn't really react well with those nitrogens being present, those heteroatoms. It would react best if something was completely carbons and hydrogens, and water and methanol are far too polar, and they would dissolve something more polar than this. This is overall a hydrophobic organic sol solute, so therefore, Chloroform is going to be our best choice. So we were asked which solvent to dissolve this compound. Chloroform is the best choice. In question 40, we're asked which of the following reactions always preserves stereochemistry. So which reaction preserves stereochemistry? For this, you need to know the mechanism of these types of reactions. In an SN1, you should know that a leaving group leaves, then we get a planar carbocation. And then our nucleophile can come in from either the top phase or the bottom phase, which means that we usually get a racemic mixture. And so stereochemistry is not maintained. So if you started out with R stereochemistry, for example, you will end up with both R and S at the end. So S in 1 is not good. E1 is not good either because in, in E1 you have a compound which like may have some stereochemistry at the beginning, but then once the leaving group leaves, we get a double bond. And a double bond is planar and does not have stereochemistry. It can depend on the double bond because you know double bonds can have the trans and cis stereochemistry, but that's a different type of stereochemistry. And so overall, this is removing the initial type of stereochemistry that was there in the beginning. So any type of elimination reaction would not be good. And finally, SN2 is also not good for preserving stereochemistry 
it's known characteristically and SN2 reactions for inverting stereochemistry. So if we had R, for example, before, it's going to be inverted to S. So the correct answer is none of the above. None of these types of reactions preserve stereochemistry. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. In that course, we go through a lot more questions and go through all the different answers explaining why each answer is right or wrong. The link to our course is going to be in the description below. Other than that, if you enjoyed what you saw on this channel, make sure to subscribe so you can keep up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.